Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can subscribe to the show. There's an RSS feed, iTunes link, as well as all the old back episodes at rce-cast.com. I also have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the esteemed authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for lending your help. Hey, Brock. A um, couple worthy things of, of mentioning here. So we're coming up in July here. So the end of July is when uh, supercomputing boffs and posters are due. So make sure you get working on that. i got to get working on my abstract for the Open MPI status, state of the world boff. Um, also, always accepting uh, questions for my blog. So Brock and I have blogs and Twitter and things like that. I just got a couple of user submitted questions, which were really great. So if you have any questions about MPI or the inner workings or outer workings of MPI, please be sure to let me know and I'll address them on my blog. Also, I'm going to be at the XC12 conference in Chicago uh, in the third or third week of July. Um, so if you're going to be there, be sure to look me up. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, we can go ahead and roll into our guest today. And I, I'm actually, I've been trying to get these guys on, and they finally agreed to do this. I don't know if I just pestered them enough over the last few years, but this software library is one of the, probably one of the most popular and most useful libraries come across in scientific computing. So what we have today is FFTW, Fastest Fourier Transform in the West. And we have with us the creators, Stephen Johnson, who is at MIT in the Applied Mathematics Department. He's a faculty there. As well as Matteo Frigo, who is currently at Quanta Research Cambridge. So uh, Stephen, Matteo, can you take a moment and introduce yourself? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Matteo Frigo. I'm originally from Italy, but I have lived uh, in the United States for almost 20 years at this point, mostly in the Boston area and in Austin, Texas. I got my PhD in computer science from MIT in 1999. Um, I'm mostly an expert in parallel computing. Uh, my main research topic was a programming system called Silk, uh, which is now part of the Intel ECC and also part of GCC 4.7, so it's uh, having its impact in the world uh, through that route. Um, I was one of the authors of the paper on cache oblivious algorithms that some of you may have heard about. Um, I've worked on several different things, including medical devices, software radios, compilers for exotic architectures, and most recently, I am at Quanta Research Cambridge, which is a research lab uh, next door to MIT, and I'm working on a form of error correction called, uh, uh, called network coding. Okay. And of course, I work on FFTW with, uh, with Steve. Hi, I'm Stephen Johnson. I'm one of the co-authors of FTW. I'm currently a professor of applied mathematics at MIT. I got my PhD in 2001 in physics from MIT, and a lot of my work uh, centers on nanophotonics, so basically electromagnetism in, uh, in media that are structured on the scale of the wavelength. And I do a lot of analytical stuff, but also a lot of uh, computational uh, stuff. Uh, we have a, a free textbook on uh, a lot of my research uh, called Photonic Crystals, Molding the Flow of Light. If you Google Photonic Crystal book, you'll find it as the first link, and you, you can download it as a free sort of undergraduate textbook. And uh, uh, so in addition to that, I work on things like solar cells, optical fibers, uh, 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 radiative heat transfer, uh, uh, micromechanical devices, uh, in a lot of different kinds of projects. And so in addition to FUTW, I've written a bunch of uh, fairly popular free software packages for uh, simulating electromagnetism. So MEEP, uh, MPB, uh, are two uh, uh, EEM simulation packages. I also have a, a package called NLOPT, which is a free nonlinear optimization package. Can you give us a basic rundown of what is FFTW and what it aims to solve? So FFTW is a software library. Uh, it's callable from C and many other languages uh, that performs fast Fourier transforms and related transforms like you know, discrete cosine transforms and discrete sine transforms, uh, which are widely used in a lot of different areas of scientific computation. Now, what does it stand for? So, I mean, you, you said the FFT part. What is the W part? So, FFTW stands for the fastest Fourier transform in the West, uh, which is you know, kind of a whimsical title. There's no 
single program that's the fastest everywhere. Uh, I think actually the, the, the name for Mateo, if you remind me, I think the name for that uh, even predates FHW. I think you, you gave me one of your – it started out with you giving me one of your old programs and calling it the fastest in the West, I think. Yeah, the story went that uh, I had written a program to compute Fourier transforms on the Connection Machine 5, uh, which was a supercomputer of the early 90s. And uh, at some point, Stephen asked me whether I had an efficient FFT code, and I gave him that program telling him, look, this is the fastest in the West, you cannot do any better than this, which wasn't true. Uh, but that's how the story started. <laughs> well, that's how all good names start, is with a story. So... For the benefit of our listeners, can you say what exactly is a, a Fourier transform and, and how is that different than a fast Fourier transform and, and where are such things useful? So uh, you know, Fourier transforms uh, uh, basically decompose a signal or a function into a set of frequencies. It's, you know, if, if you look at the graphic equalizer on your stereo or whatever, that where the little bar is going up and down, you hear music and it decomposes it into how much of that is bass, how much of that is treble, and an FFT or a Fourier transform just does that in much more detail. Uh, a there are a lot of varieties of, of Fourier transforms mathematically. On a computer, you deal with discrete signals that have you know, a finite number of data points, uh, and the, the way you transform those is something called a discrete Fourier transform. And a fast Fourier transform is an algorithm to compute a discrete Fourier transform quickly. Uh, so it, it, if you have n points, it famously can do it in order n log n operations. And these are used for a huge number of applications. You know, the obvious ones are things like audio processing, where y you directly think of filtering a signal in terms of taking out certain frequency components or enhancing other frequency components. But there's a lot of non-obvious applications that don't seem to have anything to do with frequencies. Uh, for example, if you just want to multiply two very large numbers with a million digits, it turns out that there's a fast way to do that uh, by performing an FFT of the digits uh, and then doing uh, a simple multiplication of each individual uh, digit and then fast Fourier transforming back. And they're used for solving partial differential equations and uh, you know, lots of problems. So you mentioned that this was you know, the connection machine original effort. Oh, what, what's a little bit more of the history of FFTW, and why do you still have it, and why do you keep working on it? So, uh, uh, as Matteo said, he you know he had actually started programming programming FFTs before me. Um, so it, around 1997, I was a graduate student. Matteo was actually a visiting scholar at MIT at that time. And I was working on uh, solving Maxwell's equations for my research. And we were using a spectral method, which involves, which requires you to do FFTs. And I, I needed an FFT that was fast. And I was using you know, my own uh, machine. We were using Linux machines. We were using, uh, logging in, using crazy 90s and a whole bunch of different supercomputers. And we wanted one that I wanted one that worked on all of them, that was parallel, so I could take advantage of all of them. That was multi-threaded because we had multi-core machines, and you know I wasn't sure which. I looked around at what was available, and it didn't seem like there was one that that did everything I wanted. In particular, there was a, not much selection of parallel FFTs at the time, uh, mostly vendor-specific ones. So, uh, you know, I was telling Matteo about this because I, I knew him. Uh, uh, at MIT, and uh, he said, oh, I have a fast FFT, super fast, fast Fourier transform, the fastest in the West, as he said, and you should use that. And it was, it was parallel with Silk. Wasn't, it wasn't uh, distributed memory, but it, it was um, multi-threaded. And so I took it, and uh, I also downloaded half a dozen other codes, uh, free codes from the Internet. You know, there's one by Singleton in 1968, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of things you can download. You, you could download even then. And I benchmarked them on uh, a couple different machines and plotted the results as a function of size. And, uh, you know, Mateo's was pretty good. It was sometimes the fastest, but not, not always. There were some, some that were faster than others. And I, I posted these graphs on, as a link on my webpage, 
And I, I sent Mateo an email about it. And uh, his girlfriend, or now his wife, is, I said he came home that day and he said, Stephen put up a web page that said, my code isn't the fastest. This, this has to change. And so we got involved in this project to try and make one code that was the fastest or near the fastest all the time. Yeah, you have to understand that in those days, uh, we had many different machines. Uh, um, so that there was UltraSpark, there was a Digital Alpha, there were various forms of PowerPC, there was MIPS, uh, you know, the MIPS uh, R10,000 that just came out. It was a massively out of order machine for the time. Uh, you know, Intel was transitioning from the in order uh, Pentium style processors to the Pentium Pro. So it was very difficult to write a single piece of code uh, that would work efficiently everywhere. And uh, just based on that, uh, background uh, um, of machines that we had, we came up with this idea of writing uh, some code that would try by itself how to run fast on your machine and try different possibilities. So the, the fact that FFTW has this particular structure that it has is sort of implied uh, uh, by the computing environment that we had at the time. I see. So that's interesting. So are you saying that when you fire up FFTW, it runs a little micro benchmark to determine what's going to run best on your machine to pick of many different algorithms? Yes. So FFTW is structured in two phases. Uh, first, you call a planning phase in which FFTW learns by itself how to compute the FFT on your machine uh, efficiently. And uh, then you actually compute as many transforms as you want, given the information that you have gathered in the first phase. And, and that was the idea um, that made FFTW different from other routines uh, doing the same thing. Now, this was not a unique idea. There were some other efforts uh, at Berkeley at the time doing the same thing for matrix multiplication. In particular, there was a project called FIPAC. Uh, that did a similar thing uh, uh, for matrix multiplication. Uh, that project, I think, has died, but um, the Atlas project has picked up a similar idea in, in that particular domain. And it is still alive and kicking today. So can you give us a little bit of a rundown of some of the things when you make this plan uh, that FFTW does to try to extract performance? Like, what's kind of your go-to performance issue that you have to tune around? Well, yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot of little things. Um, yeah, so the way, you have to first you have to understand how, how FFTs work. Uh, so the basic algorithm is, is suppose you have a, a transform of size n. What it does is it breaks it up into smaller uh, FFTs uh, of the sizes that are given by the factors of n. So for example, if you have a size 1,000, FFT, it could break it into 10 FFTs of size 100, uh, or it could break it into uh, 20 FFTs of size 50, uh, and, and so forth. And also if, uh, uh, 50 FFTs of size 20 at the same time. So the first choice you have to make is what factorization to use, right? You could divide, for example, the, the classic strategy, you know, from 1965 is if you have a power of two size, let's just divide into two each stage. So we have a, if you have 1,024, you divide into two transforms of size 512, and each of those into two transforms of size 256 and so forth. And that, that actually turns out not to be a good idea on today's processors. But there's a whole bunch of additional choices that the algorithm has to make because in addition to deciding what factorization, how to decompose the transform, it has to decide what order to do those subtransforms in and where to store things in memory. So it has a, a lot of choices on, on different memory rearrangements it can make in the course of the transform that have a huge impact on performance not nowadays because the, the memory architecture is, is so important in determining the performance of, of computational code. So does this... This happens um, in the user's code, or does this happen at build time? Because like we had Atlas on here, and they kind of do all their probing when you build it, and then it's kind of set in stone. Yeah. So this happens at runtime. Uh, well, th th there's. I mean, th th it is possible to do it ahead of time and save the plan, and then reuse it later on. Uh, but you know, there, there's a difference, a key difference here from matrix multiplication. 
which is what Atlas is doing. So uh, the difficulty is that if you're doing – because the FFT algorithms depend upon the factorization of the size. If you have a, an algorithm for size n, the algorithm for size n plus 1 is completely different because the factorization is completely different. Whereas if you're doing a matrix multiplication and you have an algorithm for, for an n by n matrix, the algorithm for the n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix is actually pretty similar. So you know, for matrix multiplications, you just have to divide the sizes into, di- into various different scales and figure out what block sizes you need for each, each scale of sizes. But for FFT, the, the algorithm choices are much, uh, are much more difficult. So you know, if, if we could, at build time, uh, uh, pl- you know, create plans for, for example, all the power of two sizes. And there is an option to, to, to do those and save those. Uh, but you know it's not practical to create plans ahead of time for every possible size that the user could, could would be interested in, especially once you once you include multidimensional transforms. So I've noticed before there's this uh, save plan and something called wisdom. Is, is this what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so so basically, uh, uh, you know, the, at the most basic level, we have the the, the ability to. to, to to create a plan, which takes a little time, it runs some experiments, um, yeah, and you can do that at runtime. But you can also do it once, save it to a file or whatever, read that in later on, and reuse it. Uh, it turns out uh, that um, that in the course of creating a plan, FHW generates more information than just how to compute that specific transform. And that information is stored in a little database in FFTW that we call the wisdom database. It's a wisdom about the machine that you're running on. So uh, technically, you, you, you don't just save one plan. You save all of the wisdom that is accumulated, and you can read that in. And, and potentially some of that information could be useful for other transforms that you might be doing. So does it ever make sense for uh, an admin or service provider you know, like myself, and I've got a cluster built out of a single architecture to kind of provide wisdom or plans for people to use so they don't have to spend time computing this, or does that not make sense? No, that, that makes perfect sense. In fact, we built in a feature in FHW uh, specifically to support that. So there's, uh, as I said, you can import the wisdom from a file or from a string or what, whatever, um, but there's a special command called import system wisdom uh, that's designed to import it from some some location that was that was set by the uh, by the sysadmin, which defaults to slash etc uh, slash fw slash wisdom. But you can put that wherever you want. So you could you could generate the wisdom once for a bunch of power of two and power of ten sizes, which are the most common sizes. You know, save it to a file someplace on your system, and then when you build FHW, you can you can you can put in that uh, uh, you can set that location as the import location for import system wisdom. So then the users can just call this this one routine and will import your uh, the wisdom from in the system wide wisdom. Now, how sensitive is that wisdom to uh, system jitter and other system types effects like? Uh, numa locality and other types of locality, and you know whether the algorithm is MPI or thread parallel or, or things like that. Uh, well, you bring up a very interesting question. Um, the, I think that, you know the, the basic FFTW mechanism. I think really works well only in the case of a sequential program running on a single core. And as you start adding parallelism, then this wisdom and this planning mechanism becomes uh, less and less reliable because of all the other activities that are going on uh, inside the system. So, you know, from, from what I've seen, just basic FFTW plus threads, uh, if you have nothing else running on the machine, the, the mechanism works reasonably well. Uh, really, when you start adding other jobs running on the same core and Numa effects and all this other stuff, uh, this, is, this becomes a very hard problem. Uh, I don't think we are doing the right thing yet, and I don't know what the right thing is. So this is a basic, I think, limitation of this technology. Um, you know, in FFTW's defense, I think we do better than other systems because at least we have some ability to adapt to the environment. 
but I don't think there is a final answer to that particular problem. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to get the absolute optimum uh, in the face of all this jitter, as you say. On the other hand, at least you can avoid algorithms that are positively bad you know, on, you know, for your memory architecture or your system. Sure. And I should probably disclaim my question that jitter is is an enormously unsolved problem in the world of HPC anyway. And so uh, I was probably more asking in terms of uh, NUMA effects and thread versus distributed memory, you know, shared memory versus distributed memory parallelism. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to assume in the HPC world, things run by themselves on whatever resources they're running on and things like that. So uh, thanks for going into that. And it probably wasn't quite fair of a question, my, my mistake. But uh, along those lines, do you have algorithms that are tuned for uh, NUMA types of localities? Yeah, I mean, yes. It's, it's, well, it's a completely different algorithm for parallelizing on threads and for paralleliz- parallelizing on distributed memory. Uh, so we have, we have an MPI uh, and MPI architect, you know, plans and algorithms built up on top of FTW. We also have shared memory threads uh, built on top of FTW. Uh, so, and, and those use very different different types of algorithms, as you can, as you can imagine. We don't have right, specifically let's... NUMA algorithms. Okay, right. So MPI, very different than threads. What I was really going for, though, was in a, in a threaded environment, particularly in you know, today's modern server architectures that are commonly used in HPC types of, of clusters, uh, are your algorithms aware of, say, cache sizes and socket and memory locality and, and things like that? Um, well, so we don't do anything specific about NUMA in the sense that we if you have a machine with multiple sockets and memory connected to the different sockets, we don't know whether the memory is local or not. So in that sense, uh, there is a possible improvement that we are not doing, and it is actually very hard to do from uh, user mode uh, because then we must make assumptions about the placement of threads on cores and so on. Um, so, so, however, that being said, um, FFTW has some built-in robustness uh, against the memory hierarchy because it tends to use uh, recursive algorithms. So it tends to chop a problem into smaller problems uh, until eventually the problem is sufficiently small that it fits into cache, and so it doesn't uh, uh, go to memory that often anymore. So just because of this um, you know, this very silly strategy, uh, we tend to do a good job uh, uh, regardless of what the memory hierarchy looks like. So there is some built-in robustness uh, of the system. Uh, FFTW does not contain any tuning parameter like the cache size, uh, uh, you know, the size of the L1 or L2 or L3 or whatever cache. Uh, we, it, 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 this, these parameters are learned automatically as part of, it, of the planning process. So moving down this line of parallelism, so you, there's a serial version of FFTW, and then there's an MPI-based version. Um, and even on most MPI codes, I've helped users build, when they use FFTW, they actually used a serial version. But I also noticed, so there's the threaded version, but there's also an OpenMP version. Um, why provide two different threading models, and what are the challenges of both? So uh, the, the, the different threading models... Uh, it, I mean, primarily, it's just to support different kinds of code. Uh, from our perspective, it was almost equally easy. I mean, I mean basically, the, 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 the P thread, the post six threads version and the OP, OpenMP uh, version actually share most of their code. It's just a different mechanism for spawning threads. And the same code also supports Windows threads. And at one point in the past, we supported Mach O threads, uh, which nobody uses anymore, so we dropped that. Um, and we supported, I think there was a Sun Threads, wasn't it? Matteo, wasn't there a Sun Threads? Yeah, Solaris Threads Solaris was a, threads, was a right. precursor of P Threads. It that's later right. became P Threads. So, you know, from our perspective, it's just as easy to support one kind of threads as another kind of threads. All we need is a, is a mechanism to spawn threads and some way to synchronize after they're done. Uh, you know, the, the reason that it, it was important to provide an OpenMP version specifically. Uh, is well, there's two reasons. So one is that actually the, a lot of the OpenMP versions uh, uh, we find are a bit better 
then threads, the post ex, the, just using raw post six threads, they, they put in a lot of tricks to keep the threads busy and to keep them pinned to different processors uh, so they interact better with the scheduler than if you just launch a, a raw post six threads. And the other main reason is that uh, uh, that if the user's code is using OpenMP, which a lot of users' codes are, then it's better if, if we use OpenMP as well so that our threads don't conflict with the user's threads, that they share the same thread pool and, and the, we allow the OpenMP uh, uh, mechanism to coordinate the, the threading in that way. So what kind of tricks do you do? What kind of algorithms are there that, that give you the speed, right? So you, I, I assume you have a lot of different types of algorithms in your different classifications. What are some typical tricks that you, that you do? Oh boy, there's there's a lot. Um, so it, it depends, as you imagine, on the size. So so first of all, there's there's a couple of different things. At the lowest level, uh, you have to understand that the, the in order to take advantage of the way CPUs work these days, you you know they have a lot of registers. They have you know fairly long pipelines. You want to give them a large block of highly optimized straight line code. Uh, you don't you don't want you don't want to call subroutines that have that have a loop that has you know two instructions in it. You want to give them hundreds of lines of, of code uh, to 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 chomp on. And so at the basic level, at the leaves of this recursive tree, the uh, uh, we call these hard coded routines called we call codelets, which which are just hard coded FFTs of small sizes, which are super highly optimized. And each one, you know, there might be a thousand or two thousand lines of straight line code. And as you can imagine, uh, it's really hard to write highly optimized code that's 2,000 lines long by hand. Uh, So we don't do that. What we do is we have a special purpose compiler, effectively, that generates these base cases. So it generates tens of thousands of lines of just different hard-coded transforms of different sizes. So, and that's really, really important for getting really good performance at the leaves and good performance for any sort of moderate size transform. And now as you go up in size, as the, as the sizes go, start to go out of cache, uh, you get much larger transforms, multidimensional transforms. There are a bunch of additional tricks uh, that have more to do with the, the memory hierarchy. Uh, you know, as Matteo said, just, just using explicit recursion already gives you some uh, uh, memory hierarchy benefits. Actually, it gives you something called cache obliviousness, uh, which uh, Matteo was a subject of, uh, uh, in part of Matteo's thesis. Um, and, uh, but in addition to that, there's a bunch of little tricks you can do. So basically, it's, it's a little hard to describe over the phone. Uh, but basically, it's a lot of little memory rearrangements. Right? So you can take, take the data that's, that, that's spread out in memory, you copy it to a little buffer that's contiguous, you do the transform there, you copy it back, you do little transpositions of the, of the data, actually make little matrix transposes, uh, again, to make things more contiguous, you, that are interleaved with the transform. Uh, in, in Matteo, can you think of any, anything else that would uh, be easy to explain? Yeah, yes. Um, there is uh, an interesting trick uh, that we do in the codeless, you know, at, at the leaves of this recursion. Um, so Stephen mentioned that we produce uh, we, we, we produce straight line code, uh, which is like a thousand or two thousand lines long. Uh, and and if you give such a code to a compiler and you don't do anything about it, most likely the compiler will generate very slow code coming out of it. And the real problem is register allocation. Is how do you fit a thousand variables into sixteen or thirty-two or sixty-four registers that your machine has? Um, so it turns out that you can uh, write the code in such a way that it is possible to do good register allocation, um, no matter how many registers your machine has. And this is another consequence of this cache obliviousness theory that that we mentioned already a couple of times. Um, and if you look at it, this, this really makes a big difference. Uh, you know, the difference between naive code and code that is generated according to this principle is about a factor of three uh, that you get uh, in you know, that, that you get just by scheduling the code right. 
Uh, and uh, I, you know, this is really the thing that makes the leaves of our recursion almost as efficient as anything you can do by hand. Cool. Uh, actually, Mateo, should, we should mention that, that that scheduling is specific to FFT algorithms, so it's something the compiler can't do for you because it's, it's not a generic uh, scheduling algorithm. So with all this high level of tricks and things that you're doing in the back end, are there knobs that the, the user can tune that they know because like, oh, I'm going to be doing this particular type of FFT, so I want to at least nudge your decision making or algorithm process in this direction or something like that? Well, it, 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 not very easily uh, in the sense of just nudging the algorithm choices. I mean, of course, it's possible to hack the code to do whatever you want, uh, but it, it's not set up to, be, to, to make it very easy to, for the user to just go in and do that. The one thing the user can do very easily is generate new kinds of codelets. So if there's a particular transform size you, you, you really care about, if you, if you really care about doing discrete cosine transforms of size uh, 120, uh, and we don't have a hard-coded transform of 120, so we, we, we would use more generic code uh, to break that into smaller sizes. Instead, there, there, it's fairly easy to, to just, in the build system, to insert one line and say, I want discrete cosine transforms of, of, of size 120, and it will generate those uh, this very efficient code for uh, for that size automatically, and, and or more generally, sort of any factor, any small factor or small size that you really care about, then if you really care about that size, actually it benefits you a lot to generate codelets for that size. So because it comes built in uh, with codelets that handle basically uh, sizes, I think one to one to sixteen. 20, 25, 32, and 64, I think those are the, 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 the built-in sizes uh, if, for, for FFTs. And so if you have some other oddball size, that, then it's, it's good to, to generate code for that. Yeah, there is another knob that the user has, uh, which is how much effort do you want to uh, invest in the planning phase? And there we have several levels. Uh, you can get a... Uh, an estimate of what the best plan is, and that is very quick. Or you can take some measurements, you can take more measurements if, if you are patient, or you can do an exhaustive search over all possible plans, uh, which takes forever and normally does, doesn't run to completion. Uh, so that, that's the other knob that the user has. So what about some things that users do have control over, like maybe the transform size a little bit? Because there's funny performance things that happen when you try to say do a number of samples that's a large prime number yeah yeah so fhw is, is unusual is less so now but uh, you know so as i said fft algorithms depend most of them depend on the factorization of the size they work by breaking a size down into its factors uh, so if you have that algorithm and you have a prime size, you can't do anything. But actually, there there are FFT algorithms and order and log n algorithms that work for prime sizes as well. Uh, and I actually initially implemented it in, in FFW for fun, uh, just because these were kind of cool algorithms, and they turn out to be really popular because that way, you know, whatever size you give it, it will still do an n log n algorithm. It won't suddenly be a million times slower if you add one to your size. Now, that being said, the, the algorithms for composite sizes are still faster. So, and, and in general, you're best off, if you, if you have some freedom in choosing the length of, of the transform, you're, you're best off if it has small factors, say, 2, 3, 5, and maybe 7. Uh, now, the conventional wisdom was that powers of two sizes are the best. And if you look at most code out there, uh, a lot of FFT codes actually historically only handled power of two sizes. And even the code that handles non-power of two sizes is often most only optimized really for powers of two. So F, but FFTW is actually optimized pretty well for a variety of small factors. So if you have a size uh, 600 transform, that, that, that factor is perfectly well in, the small factor, in small factors, it's not going to be worth it to pad that up to the next power of two to size 1,024. That'll actually probably be slower than, than size 600. 
Uh, but if you do have a size with large prime factors, if you have the ability to get that to to tweak that and make it a size that has many small factors, uh, that that's probably a good idea. So let's change direction here a little bit here. Uh, what uh, what language is FFTW written in? And you mentioned earlier in the podcast that you have bindings for uh, a lot of languages, so you can call FFTW from many different types of applications. What bindings do you support as well? So okay, there's those are two separate questions. So uh, to begin with, which language is written in is, is a, a little bit complicated in the sense that uh, there's a two step process. So as we said, these codelets, these leafs, these base cases of recursion are all automatically generated. And so, the, so that code, that those codelets are spit out by another program we wrote. And the, and the generator program is written in a functional language uh, called OCaml, which is a nice language for writing compiler-like programs in. And this OCaml code spits out C code, and the rest of FHW is written in C. Uh, so basically the end result is the user doesn't even need uh, OCaml on their machine unless they want to generate new code. All they need is a C compiler. And then that C compiler, uh, C code, uh, of course we support calling that from C++. Uh, and we also support calling that from Fortran. So we re- originally had Fortran 77 bindings. And in the most recent version we added new bindings for the, the Fortran 2003 or whatever the latest Fortran standard is, that, which added uh, the new Fortran standard has explicit support for calling C code, which makes it much easier to add bindings. And in addition to C, C++, and Fortran, uh, there's a, a bunch of bindings that users have added for different languages that you know we don't, we don't we're not involved in those directly so i wouldn't say that we support them but you know, they, they they exist out there uh, I mean, there's bindings for c sharp and python and eiffel and ada and java, java yeah. uh and uh guile which is a scheme compiler there's pa- pascal bindings uh modula 3 ruby perl Lisp and you know probably other ones that we're not aware of. So uh, with FFTs, you're dealing with complex numbers a lot, and there's been some changes there with C and C. I forget the newest C update. C ninety nine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know Fortran has a native complex type. Uh, kind of does FFTW play nicely with this and moving back and forth between the two types? Yes. So so when we wrote FFTW. Uh, you know, in the initial version, 1997, complex numbers were not a part of the C standard. Uh, and they were added in 1999. Even even after they were added, it, it's it's still taking some time for them to be widely supported. And they're still not supported in, for example, the Microsoft Visual C++ compilers because they're not compi- They don't really compile C. They compile C++, which has its own complex number type. So we don't inter- – internally to FHW, we don't use the, these uh, – the, we don't take advantage of the C complex number support. Uh, we, we do our own complex arithmetic. Uh, but we store complex numbers in a format that's binary compatible with the, you know, the C and C++ and Fortran complex numbers. All, the C, C and C++ and Fortran complex numbers are required by the standard – to be internally stored as just the real part followed by the imaginary part. So since we store it that way, then you can, you can call FHW with, with C99 complex numbers or C++ complex arrays or Fortran complex arrays with no translation overhead. All it is is a pointer typecast. Uh, and, and we even have some support, some hackery in the header files, so, so that in the case of C99, you don't ha- you, you don't even have to do a, a pointer type, type cast. Now, it, 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 maybe Matteo should comment also that there's there's some reasons why in the, at the code level, I think it's it's actually not desirable for us to use the C99 complex numbers. That we can actually do more. Uh, by having access to the real and imaginary parts separately and doing our uh, arithmetic on those things separately. Well, this gets very technical, but it has to do with the fact uh, that uh, it is sometimes convenient to view a complex number um, 
as an array of two real numbers, do vector operations on this array, so really treat them as if they were independent real numbers and only combine them at the end. Uh, This is a thing uh, that is useful if you're doing, uh, if you're using CMD instructions like SSC and SSC2 and AVX uh, and Altivec and all of that. Uh, But it gets very technical to, to discuss exactly why that's the point. But to go back to the original question, I also want to say that we support uh, the alternative format of complex numbers where you have a separate array of real parts uh, and an array of imaginary parts, which is the format that was very popular a while ago because MATLAB was using it. I don't know if they're still using it, but that's definitely another popular format, and FFTW will work well with that format as well. So this has nothing to do with a C99 uh, uh, complex types. It's a much older um, numerical libraries convention. So you mentioned MATLAB in there. I notice MATLAB has FFTW in it, and we talked about bindings. Let's move up a level. What popular, well-known, full-user applications use FFTW? So it, it's hard, a little hard to keep track of you know which things are using FFTW. Uh, MATLAB, as as you mentioned, uses FFTW internally for its FFTs. Uh, also, several MATLAB like free MATLAB MATLAB like programs like GNU Octave uses FFTW. Scilab, I believe, uses FFTW. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of other free software packages uh, that use FFTW. I just went to the Debian. I went to the Debian, Debian GNU Linux uh, uh, package database and just looked at which things uh, use FFW and then did a Google search just to, to see. So, for example, Cinelera, which is a free video editing, editing package, uses it apparently. Krita, which is a image editing program. There's a whole bunch of scientific programs. Uh, for example, several molecular dynamics codes, Gromax and Amber uh, and Espresso, I'll, I'll use it. There's a bunch of quantum chemistry codes that use it because FFTs are pretty central in how uh, people usually solve uh, density functional theory for finding uh, electron distributions in, in solids. So uh, Abinit and VASP and, and quantum, quantum Espresso is another package that uses it. Uh, there's GNU Radio, which is a software radio program, uses it. Uh, the apparently the the Myth TV uh, package, which is a, dig- a DVR, a digital video recorder, and you know it's basically a, a box that sits and controls your television. And that apparently uses it for some audio processing. There's a 3D game engine called Panda 3D that uses FFTs. I have no idea what for. Um, so, uh, and Matteo, I think you, you, you... Yeah, I saw the other day that Pulse Audio, which is an audio demon for GNU Linux, uh, uses FFTW to implement an equalizer. I was surprised when I tried to install it on Debian and somehow it dragged in the FFTW library. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, there's, and, and there's probably a couple hundred you know, you know, commercial software packages that, that have licensed FFTW uh, for, for use in their code as well. Um, I'm not sure where I'm at liberty to say what they are, but you know, there's there's quite a few out there apparently. So then, why I'm really curious. It seems like FFTW is kind of currently the leader and winner for brain share and market share for you know FFT stuff. Why do you think FFTW has been the success? Well, you know, there's there's a couple of reasons. Uh, you know the the most obvious selling point is is performance that it's going to achieve good performance on a on a bunch of different platforms but uh you know, i think the the real underlying reasons you know even though scientists say they care about performance i think in practice people care about generality even more they don't want their their programs to be they they don't want what they can do they can do to be limited by their software and fgtw Especially when it started out, even now, it's, it's pretty unusual in the degree of generality it has. It's not only portable so, so, and supports different platforms, supports threads and MPI and so forth, but it also supports transforms of any size, including prime so- sizes, of any dimensionality, of real data, of complex data, uh, all you know, all four popular types of discrete cosine transform and four, four types of discrete sine transform. 
and mixes. You can do a multidimensional transform that has discrete cosine transforms along some directions and discrete sine transforms along other directions. And, and that kind of generality is, is uh, pretty unusual. The only thing that comes even close is uh, the, uh, right now I think, is the Intel math kernel libraries, uh, which even support, actually, they support the FFTW interface. But even the math kernel libraries don't support quite the full functionality of FTW. They don't support the variety of data types that we support or the variety of sine and cosine transforms that we support and so forth. So yeah, another question that I'd like to... Oh, I'm basically sorry. We uh, just wanted, basically, we just wanted to solve the problem once and for all and, uh, and have a library that will work in all cases. And I think we are very close to that goal. So another question that I'd like to ask uh, other fellow software developers is, uh, what version control system do you use and why? So we use, uh, you know, we, we was initially using CVS for a long time because that was just what people used in 1997. Uh, at some point, we got tired of CVS, uh, as most people do, and we decided to switch to a distributed version control system. And uh, uh, it, it turns out that uh, a guy... Uh, 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 David Roundy, who wrote the Darks version control system, actually had an office just a couple doors down from mine, and, and I was already using it on you know, several other projects, and I liked the interface, even if I didn't like some other aspects of it. I liked it better than, better than Git at the time, which, especially early on, Git, the interface was very low level. It's gotten better than, since then. So we started using Darks, and we've continued to use Darks uh, since then. Wow, I think you are the first RCE guest uh, that uses Darks. Um, interesting, <laughs> fascinating. I, I love this stuff. Um, all right, another, another question. What license do you guys use? Since you're used in a lot of other uh, software packages, it uh, would be good to hear what you did and why. So uh, uh, I think in the very first release of FW, I think we, we didn't really think about it. We just put some boilerplate thing that they were using at the Laboratory for Computer Science, which is free for non-commercial use. So what, what uh, Richard Stallman calls semi-free. Uh, and then we, we quickly found that this, this just caused a bunch of headaches uh, that, that we hadn't anticipated, that people wanted to include it on a CD that they sold for a couple bucks, but since that's commercial, then they wanted to know if they could do that. Uh, uh, you know, the, the people working at a company, they, they just wanted to use it internally on their, within their company. Uh, not to sell it or anything, but, but of course, a company is commercial, so they wanted to know if that was allowed. And this is just a, a pain. And so we, we switched uh, to using the GNU uh, GPL uh, version two or later. And uh, we, we've, we've pretty much stuck with that. So that it, But at the same time, when companies like MATLAB want to use F50W, uh, you know, they... If, they're not willing to use it under the GPL, which would require them to make all of MATLAB free software. And uh, uh, so they, they, they basically contact MIT and, and purchase an alternative license. So companies basically can, can buy a, a, uh, an unlimited use license from MIT for some amount of money. And the GPL worked nicely uh, for that because I actually uh, – uh, we had to convince because MIT owns part of the copyright to uh, to uh, FTW, and we had to switch, convince MIT to allow us to switch to the GPL from this original non-commercial use license that we had adopted without thinking. And it was pretty easy to allow to, to convince them to use the GPL because the GPL isn't going to cut into their licensing revenue because because. Effectively, it's non-commercial use with respect to companies like MathWorks and so forth that want to incorporate it into their software. So you still, they still have to buy licenses from MIT, so it doesn't hurt MIT's licensing business. And at the same time, the GPL is, is better for us. It's, it's, it's clear about the kinds of use we want to allow. That you know, It's perfectly fine if you use it inside your company. It's perfectly fine if you include it on your Linux uh, CD that you sell for a few dollars. Uh, and, and it's compatible with a much larger universe of, uh, of free software than, than a semi-free license is. Uh, 
So the you know the the other possibility was to use something like the LGBL, uh, which we chose not to do for a couple of reasons. So you know, one is just from MIT's perspective, if, if we had used the LGBL. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to sell licenses because MATLAB, MathWorks would have been able to use it for free in MATLAB because they just link it as a shared library. Uh, and from our perspective, we don't see any particular reason that we want to s- subsidize MathWorks. If, if, you, if you want to use FTW in a product like MATLAB or, or some other p- product that you're selling, then you know, it, it, we feel like you shouldn't be able to do that for free. You should g- at least give us a little bit mo- of money. Um, it, it is a, a little bit unfortunate in the sense that, uh, you know, there's, as you know, there's a variety of free software licenses out there, and not all of them are GPL compatible. And you know, we we we'd love to allow FTW to be used in software that happens to use the MPL or some other free software license, but just from a you know a legal standpoint, it's it's too difficult to do that to if, to to you know, to open up, uh, to add exceptions for those things without opening up the door to uh, uh, uses that we don't want to, want to allow. Yes, and from this perspective, I want to point out that we're still using GPL version 2 and not version 3 precisely oh. because we want to be compatible with the most software possible that is out there that is not necessarily compatible with GPL v3. Well, it's GPL version 2 or later. So FTW, if you want to distribute it under version 3, you can. If you want to link it with GPLv3 software, you can. I mean, I don't think we have – I don't have any objection to, to version 3, uh, you know, for its, its own sake. It's just a question of compatibility. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the future of FFTW. Um, what things do you want to add or see changed? So, you know, from my own perspective, the, one of the things I've wanted to, to, to do for a while, which is still on the, you know, it's, it's not clear what the time frame for this is, is, is to add direct support for convolutions to FHW. Uh, so one of the most common operations that you're using FFTs for is this thing called the convolution, um, which is used for filtering and multiplying large numbers and solving partial differential equations that involves taking two arrays, FFTing them, multiplying them point by point and then FFTing them back. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that you can do a much better job uh, if, you, if you do that as one operation than if you do it as, as separate FFTs. So that's, that's one thing that you know, I would very much like to work on if one, once we find time or, or maybe get a graduate student to, to work on that. Uh, of course, there's always performance tweaking, and, and uh, with MPI, it would be nice to support more data distribution models. Uh, people keep talking to us about asking us about uh, uh, GPU support, uh, which you know, if if those continue to be popular, we may eventually have to do something there. Uh, from my own st- standpoint, I, you know, I'm kind of hoping that that uh, the GPUs turn into more can conventional shared memory systems, at least from a software development standpoint, uh, then they're, they're currently kind of exotic systems to program, uh, which, which uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a good way forward to, for the computer industry. But, you know, we, we, we may eventually have to support those. You know, the people bugged us for cell support for, for ages when, you remember, the, there was a big buzz about the cell processor, and we finally added it, and then I think nobody uses it, as far as I can tell, uh, which was a bit frustrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, the, the issue of supporting new instruction sets is always an important issue. Like, uh, you know, the FMA instructions are already implemented in AMD machines, I think, and they are either implemented or will come out soon on Intel processors. So we'll need to decide what to do about that. Uh, there will be new instructions. Um, so Intel now has this MIC processor, which is a derivative of Arabi, uh, which has its own SIMD instructions, which are 512 bits wide. So we'll need to do something about that at some point. Um, yeah, that, that that's another direction in which we will continue to work on. 
Yeah. So initially, you know, when we first started working on this in 1997, and we, we got the initial version together, and it, it was spring break, and we decided to, you know, to, to work really hard and, and, and get the release available by the end of spring break. And you know, I remember Matteo telling me, you know, you have to be, you have to be careful. We, we, we should just, we should just release this and then be done with it. But we'll release it and we'll solve the problem. And we can walk away because otherwise, you can spend your entire life doing FFTs. Uh, <laughs> and there are certainly people out there that that <laughs> FFTs have become their entire career. Uh, it, it hasn't quite become a, you know our entire careers, but it's it's certainly something that's that's continuing into the indefinite future. Okay, well, Stephen, Matteo, thank you very much for your time.、Uh, what's the website for FFTW and where people can get information? That's FFTW.org. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.